Gospel according to John, St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus, or excuse me, when Judas, big difference, <laughs> when Judas went out, Jesus said, now, now the Son of God has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You'll look for me, and as I said to the Jews and the religious leaders, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should love one another, and by this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord, praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, the one who redeems and sustains us. Amen. I'm just going to move this a little bit. Many years ago, I taught a variety of Sunday school age kids. It was my turn to teach, teach the fourth grade Sunday school class. And guess what? They were all boys. <laughs> and this, I was on the internship, so way up, way up near Fargo. I sat down with them on the floor in a kind of an open space, so they were free from touching things but they could still touch each other. And the lesson for that day was this lesson, the commandment that Jesus tells us to love one another. Well, guess how fourth grade boys interpret that? And one of the boys, I don't remember his name, he turned and he, to his, the kid next to him and he's like, I love you. <laughs> and, they, and they get a kissy face, and, you know. I love you, and he just, at the whole, I, I, I lost control at that point. There was no coming back from that. But a fourth grade boy's thoughts about love, no matter what age, what grade, girl or boy, will change over the decades, won't it? He's about 23 years older now. I'm sure he has had different thoughts about love since then. And I'm sure that Jesus knew this too, that our thoughts about love changes as we change, as we grow, as we experience life. Jesus himself was a fourth grader, a fourth grade boy nonetheless, one, you know, at one point. No matter our age, no matter the time that we live in history, Jesus gives us a command to love one another. And you know what? We know it when we're loved. We know it. We know it when we love and when we are loved. The parent of that fourth grade boy who every morning comforts his son who has great anxiety before going to school every year that he is in school. What I experienced at Lutheran Campus Ministry here in Milwaukee at the Corner House. One friend in the Corner House who every day often would give her friend who also lived in the Corner House a giant hug and said, I love you. And just, it was a, a, what I thought initially was an awkward embrace, kind of long, but only to learn that the girl she was hugging just lost her mom or the spouse who remains vigilant next to the side of his or her spouse who is deep in depression. Or as we experienced and heard some of us here this past Wednesday evening, the mothers, several mothers at Hephatha Lutheran Church, one of our partner churches, who tirelessly work with the coalition of lead emergency 
to help every family that they can keep their babies safe from lifelong, lifelong, every day of their life, debilitating lead poisoning. It was quite a testimony to hear. We know love when we see it. We know love when we hear it. And we know love when we experience it, whether it's happening to us or if we are a part of affecting love on someone else. Jesus said, love one another just as I have loved you. The verb tenses are interesting. It's an ongoing action. It didn't just happen one moment at that dinner table with him and the disciples. Like, oh, I said, it. okay, I'm done. Check. No. It's to the church, dear church. It's to the world. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is still speaking to us today and will speak to us and people tomorrow. Theology, doctrine, dogma, liturgies, all of this is good stuff, but it is little to nothing if we are not rooted in the foundation of love, loving each other every day. And then we just remind, remember this, Jesus gives this command sitting around a table, a dinner table, with his friends during their last meal together, just before he is arrested, which leads to his death and resurrection. Recli reclined around that table, Jesus had just washed all of their feet. You know how that feels. I mean, how would you like it if I came up to you and just started washing your feet? It's uncomfortable, we're vulnerable, Ugh. But Jesus just did this, an act of servitude and love to his disciples. And then he shares that meal, bread and wine and others, and promises them that he will be with them every time they share in this meal again to this day and tomorrow and after. Jesus is present. And with their feet, I'm sure, still damp from the foot washing, Jesus then tells them, you all must keep loving each other as I love you, and Judas slips away out the door. That is when God is glorified. It's an interesting moment. When I started reading, I slipped up Jesus and Judas. That's when Judas goes out to betray the Son of God just after he tells everyone, us, the disciples, to love each other, and Judas sneaks out, and that's when we hear in John's Gospel, and this is the moment, the exact moment, when Jesus is glorified. We think, whoa, John must have gotten something wrong there. God was glorified in Christ in that moment as he still in the face of betrayal, knowing that Peter also would deny him later, still loves his disciples to the end. And the end was just unraveling at that moment. That he still in loving servitude, loved them to the end with his body, with his blood, with his entire spirit, incarnate, human, and God, true glory, I know, now I know, being in Milwaukee with the Bucks, we were hoping in six, right? And you think, the glory, and then we move on. It's so easy to get caught up in that sort of glory. And that's fun glory, that's wonderful. It's celebrative. It's more than that though, it's definitely more than that with God. Glory in God, is Jesus being merciful to Judas, still washing his feet, knowing what Judas will do. That is God's glory. God in glory in God is Jesus consoling Peter and commissioning him to begin the church, even when Peter denies him how many times? Three. Glory is God in Jesus telling John, the beloved disciple, one of his closest friends, 
to take care of Mary, his mother, as Jesus was dying on the cross. Glory. Glory is God in Jesus welcoming us to his table. That's not our altar. That's Jesus' altar for the world. Dining with him on his very presence and spirit and body and blood as we are nourished as community together, even though, even though we will rebel against God and are often less than loving or patient with each other. Glory is God in Jesus giving up his life that we will see how far God will go to know that we are loved by our creator and redeemer and sustainer. I would argue that we cannot know what true love is without Jesus. We can't know what true glory is without Jesus. But through Jesus, we not only know and get a glimpse of what it is, but we are restored to wholeness that we might live and love each other with Christ-like love. We do not do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. We, we, we do it fulfilled with the presence of God that filled Jesus, which makes us capable of being Christ-like. The resurrection, that empty cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus is God's ultimate glory and love that conquers death that conquers sin and suffering and betrayal and denial and everything that seeks to destroy. When we face hardship, sickness, barriers, failures, war, infringements and abuses of human rights, when institutions of all sort fail us and humanity suffers, we need something greater than just the idea of love and glory, don't we? I mean, amen. We can't do it on our own. We need something greater than just the love that we can muster up on our own. And we have confidence in Christ through God because God has handled all of this. God's got it and has handled it and continues to handle it through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So we are capable, we are capable of loving each other and being merciful and also reveling in the glory of God that is transformational. Just as that parent comforted his fourth grade son who every day suffered anxiety before school that friend in college who hugged her friend and roommate who was grieving the loss of her mom. The spouse who remains vigilant next to his or her spouse who is suffering deep depression. The mothers of Hephatha who work tirelessly for the coalition of lead emergency. They know love and glory and the church that moves, the churches across the world that move from Sunday morning worship into actions of love and mercy and grace to revel in God's glory in working the rest of the days of the week for the wellness of each other. We know this love, we see it, we hear it, and it is transformational. And if you're thinking, I don't know about, I. I, are you seeking this? I would like this. If you're wondering about that, it's yours, a pure gift through Jesus. Splash around in those waters, the baptismal promise that God makes to you every day and claims you and names you and loves you by heart. That is, excuse me, that is glory. And we get to manifest that in our actions, in our lives in the actions of this church and the community at large around us. The ongoing verb, loving. Love this community as Jesus loves. 
Just remember that command. You must love one another. It is a gift, this must. You must love one another just as I loved you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah.